cool. And so this is going to be a really cool. So one thing the chat is just if you could keep your yourselves muted unless we say, hey, unmute yourself and tell us your question. Um, but stay muted just so that we don't have background noise. The chat is totally there for networking, guys, and questions. So go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. And if you want to share your LinkedIn link, I know you guys are all here to, you know, meet each other too. So as much as possible, um, you know, also don't forget we have our Slack channel. You can get to the uh, invite link on the front of our meetup page. So just scroll down and it's right there and you can join that. That's a great way to get to know people. Um, and then we also have a Facebook group if you guys want to find us there and not just on Meetup. All right. Uh, I, before I get to the agenda, Amanda, do you want to tell us a little bit about the events coming up? Yes. So we have two events coming up before the new year. We have one in November covering the topic of how to make your past skills look good if you're moving into UX. And the meetup in December is just a fun, ugly sweater happy hour get together. So looking forward to those. And um, we will continue to let you know what the new year meetup schedule will look like when we have it solidified. Yes, and I have to say, we want to celebrate the fact that we have a thousand, more than a thousand members on Meetup. Oh my gosh, it's super huge and exciting. Yay! So excited that we could build this community of UX designers. Thanks to you guys. Um, and then also, uh, we're going to have a great lineup in 2021. If you're on Slack and you have an idea or suggestion, maybe you know someone that would be a great speaker, please reach out to us. We want to know. Um, but I am working on a speaker to talk about dark UX patterns, hopefully sometime in early 2021. Uh, that's what I have right now. OK, tonight, I'm going to introduce our panelists. And then I'm going to start asking questions. We're gonna monitor the chat. So if you guys have questions, I'm gonna try not to use all the question time. I really want you guys to have an opportunity to ask questions. So uh, uh, Andrina and Amanda totally have my permission to interrupt me <laughs> and jump in with questions that you guys are asking. And um, we're gonna take it from here. Are you all ready? Cool. All right, so I want to introduce our three panelists. Uh, we first have Stephanie Sarvis. She is a rotational experience designer at Zynga. Stephanie grew up playing N64. She was drawing pictures of her favorite things. She was into science. And a few, until a few years ago, she just never dreamed that her passions for video games and analysis could all be satisfied in one career. So she found her way into UX in games after working in the theme park and education industries. And I have been, I actually worked with Stephanie. She's been a TA uh, for the boot camps uh, for at least two different ones. And so that's how I got to know her. We're also joined by Amber Holken, Holkenbrink, sorry if I misspelled that or didn't pronounce that correctly, Amber, but she has been working in the video game industry for 12 and a half years. She's right now an associate uh, UI UX lead working on the Call of Duty Warzone at Raven Software, uh, and that's in Middleton, Wisconsin. And then she works with our returning fan favorite, Sydney Terrace. She is also a UX designer at Raven Software. She works on Call of Duty. She's got a fascinating background. If you guys haven't watched the previous video of the, the women, women facing uh, challenges in UX design, we go into all of that there. But I'll just succinctly tell you, she was getting her you know, graduate degree in physics before taking a severe you know, left turn uh, and after working at Coca-Cola and discovering a passion for UX design. She's currently getting her master's in UX design with me at MICA, and I am just really excited to know her. Um, and all of these panelists, thank you guys for joining us. Big round of virtual applause, everybody, yay. All right, all right, I'm gonna kick this off um, with a softball question and let one, each of you answer this in turn. Tell me a little bit about your respective career path, specifically how and why you found your way into video gaming as a UX designer. I know I kind of gave a preview for Stephanie there, but you could you know, elaborate a little if you want to start us off, Steph. 
Absolutely, I would love to. So um, you'll, I think you'll find that a lot of people um, getting to UX kind of have a career change moment just because UX is pretty new still, um, but even more so in the video game industry, I find. Um, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. I spent my 20s kind of exploring stuff and um, I knew that I was very scientifically inclined and artistically inclined. And I was kind of like, which one do I do? And um, of all places, I was at a party. Um, my partner is a software engineer. And so he, he knew a lot of people in the video game industry. And I met someone at that party. He's like, hey, I'm a senior UX designer at EA. Uh, this is what I do. I went, holy crap, that sounds amazing. And I just kind of researched uh, what it what it means to be in UX and uh, specifically in the game industry and then just kind of took a boot camp and went from there. Um, that was that answers all of the parts of the question, right, Cindy? Yeah, you know, and I remember you did a lot of interviewing leading up to the role that you now have at Zynga, right? Yes, yes. So a good good tip because um, I haven't found that there's really um, UX design, like formal education, like in for video game industry specific stuff, because, you know, designing apps and websites is very different um, than games. And so in addition to my education, I had to kind of do a lot of self-taught stuff. And I did that by, I, I literally, there's, uh, I think it's called Game Dev Map, and it lists every single studio in Austin. And I went line by line, and there was a lot of them. And I, I looked up all the studios in Austin, and I looked up people who worked at those, all the studios via LinkedIn. I just reached out. Anyone who had UX, UI design in their title, and I was like, hey, can you meet for coffee? I want to know about more You want uh, more about what you want to do. Nowadays, you probably can't do a coffee meetup, but maybe a Zoom meeting or something. They'd be, there's so many nice people out there who are willing to just talk about themselves and what they do. And that's kind of how I learned um, any skills that I was missing, um, you know, I, I was told to like dabble in Unity and Unreal because those are the two main game engines just so you can get your own experience because that's not taught in design school, right? Um, so that kind of stuff just to help prepare me for uh, where I am now, um, which so I'm in, in contrast to the other two uh, ladies here, I'm just getting started in my career. I finally made it. I just started this job in August. So I'm very entry level and we'll have a very different perspective of things compared to them as well. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Stephanie. Amber, I wanted to ask about your path into gaming and, and as a UX designer. Sure. Uh, first of all, all the advice that Stephanie gave was amazing and good on you for just hitting the pavement and making that happen. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I was supposed to be a Pixar character animator. That was like my original dream. Um, I went to school for character animation and I ended up getting an internship at a video game company to do lip sync work for the characters. Um, and then after the internship, they contacted me and they're like, well, do you want to work in the UI department? We need UI artists. And I was like, what is UI? I have no idea. Um, we didn't have smartphones at the time. So it really wasn't anything outside of web development that I even thought of doing. Um, so I just started doing like icon work at this small company for like Dora and Diego Kid Games and I could apply all my animation skills to that and then, um, you know, the longer I was in that position, I started to realize that like UI is coupled with UX, it deserves to have design behind it and thought behind it um, and like the thing that I loved about animations animated movies was like the interaction you had with the audience and like the emotion you evoked with it and like ux is one of those things that it's just i think a lot of people just see it as buttons and menus and it's so much more than that especially when you're in video games um because you're not just laying out a menu you are helping lay out an experience for the player and so once i realized what ux was then i started doing what stephanie did and started looking for resources outside of the company i was at um there is um, like a game UX summit now, um, and I've been doing a lot of research. Like that's what really got me going with my UI UX career rather than just UI artist. Um, but yeah, so I was at that studio for about 10 years and then I found my way to Raven Software and it's just been a crazy ride in the Call of Duty world ever since. 
Yeah. So it's called, is it called UX Game Summit? So we can find it online. Yes, it's U the UX Game Summit. Um, it's put on by Celia Hodent. Um, she actually is, is the author of the only book that I know of that's about game UX and it's called The Gamer's Brain. I recommend it to everybody. Um, and she was actually a psychologist who was hired by Epic to work on their uh, work on Fortnite and figure out how to make that super accessible for players. Um, so I highly recommend everybody read that if you're interested in UX and games. It's awesome. Oh, that's great advice. Sydney, what about your path? Yeah, so like Cindy said, I very much weaved and left turned into this field. But um, I was going to school for a graduate degree in theoretical physics when I saw a job posting at my school for an internship with Activision. And at that time, um, I felt very disconnected from what I was doing with physics. Um, I wasn't really passionate about it anymore. And when I saw that there was a job posting for working in video games, that was the first time it had ever occurred to me that real people get to work on video games. And I was like, that is so cool. I want to do that. So I applied, did the internship, and fell absolutely in love with the passion of the people I was working with, the product that we were working on, and the kinds of problems that we were solving. I felt like all of my coworkers were people that I loved to hang out with and they really made it a joy to come to work and they also supported me and put me on platforms to make positive change in the product, even as an intern. Um, and then the product Call of Duty is just unbeatable in the space, um, working on that and helping to support the game experience of 80 million fans is like no other experience I've had. So I very happily returned for a full-time offer after dropping out of school. Um, and so I've been at Raven Software working on Call of Duty ever since then. Um, and pretty much the only education I had in user experience design before that was, I had sort of lucked into or networked into a couple internships at Coca-Cola. Um, the beverage company. And really, I just started there on their information architecture team. Um, and they did a lot of innovation work there. And a UX designer there really took me under her wing and showed me her craft. And that's kind of how I got into user experience design and really fell in love with it from there. So when I was applying to internships from that point forward, it was really on this real world experience and not really on my education, if that makes sense. Um, so then beyond um, just the internship in games and the full-time job in games. I've been, like Cindy said, been pursuing a master's in user experience design to really help with those foundations of language and communicating my work. But that has been my path so far into UX in games. Um, like I said, it took a real left turn there in the middle, but it's been super fun. And it's like a complete adrenaline rush to be in this industry. It sounds like, and I am absolutely fascinated with it because I, I mean, like, it's obvious to me as someone who doesn't do games that there's a big difference in like what I design for typically and what you all do. And but I tried, I did a little bit of searching, a little bit of trying to educate myself before this. And one thing that really stuck out to me in the one article that I read was about like the number one rule is is not being unfair to the users, the players? Is that like something that you all kind of feel as UX designers? And, and tell me more about that. Um, I can kind of speak to that. So I'm not sure like exactly the context they had that in, but being like unfair to the players. So I think there's like from like a game experience point of view, it's just there's like a difference between this game is hard and challenging and I want to keep going so I can be good at it. And like, this is broken. It's like, this is like a broken kind of hard, right? And so like, um, and with UI, UX like in game, there's always that question of like, are we spoon feeding them too much information to get them to the next thing? Like, do we highlight the objective right away? Or do we like wait a certain amount of time before we highlight them this objective to like prompt them to go to the thing? Because you don't want players to have a bad time. And like, I think, back when video games first started and it was like text entry, it was just sort of like, you're in a cave and there's a wizard and blah, blah, blah. And like, if you didn't put in the exact like words that would unlock it, then you weren't going anywhere. Sorry, dogs. Um, but yeah, so like that is like something all the time is like what's unfair versus challenging as far as that experience. 
Um, but yeah, that's what triggered in my brain when you said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's right on like what the article was talking about. Like it's unfair to like hide something in the UI or make it like specifically really hard for the user so that they can't figure out what they have to do, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so talk to me, maybe each of you can like give me your perspective of like when you are starting something new, whether it be a new feature or maybe it's, um, you know, just like looking at something fresh, like what, it, what are your steps? What is the first thing that you all kind of do when you're examining like a project? I see Stephanie um, nodding her head. Hmm. <laughs> I can speak a little bit to that. Um, when I'm starting work on a feature, um, normally it'll be something is carved out by the game design team saying, you know, hey, we want to do this cool interaction. We want to make this little thing. How do we communicate that to the player? What's the coolest approach to that? And I do use the word cool on purpose because it's not just about, you know, making sure that the player has the information, but it's making sure that there is fun and joy and excitement with interacting with that thing. Um, so when that happens, a lot of times I'll look to other sources of entertainment for inspiration. So that can be like, what are movies doing? Like what's cool about this intro to this movie or that theming or that audio? Um, definitely what are other games doing? Um, all forms of art and entertainment, I think there is a period of searching through what's inspirational, what's cool, what do we want to work on? And mostly like, what do we want to play? And what do we think our fans want to play with? And then from there, um, it's how do we make that work for our game? Um, what are the boundaries that we're working within that may be the same or different from our inspiration sources? And how do we adapt it and evolve, evolve it to make it look better, to make it play better, more fun, more interactive? Um, and then from there, we get more into the traditional user experience process where starting with wireframes, talking to the game design team, to play testers and saying like, hey, is this doing what we think it's going to do? And then once we're getting through the functionality and getting that pat down, um, it's reskinning things, making them look pretty and on theme and setting the mood and the tone, um, and then just iteration. So that's pretty much the process that I've been going through. What's it look like at, at Zynga? Very similar to what uh, Sydney just said. I was like, yes, yes, all those things. Definitely looking at inspiration from other games, um, even other forms of media or even apps. Um, in case anyone here does not know, Zynga, uh, their main focus is on mobile games. And so uh, that basically means that um, when a game is live, like it's it's just constantly going, you don't ship it and like you're done with it. You just you're, you continuously work on it. Um, so our features are interesting that they kind of build upon what's already existing. Um, so that's another thing is like a, a feature that you might start, um, it's kind of piggybacking or accentuating something. So you kind of uh, look into the existing feature. Okay, like what does this do? Um, what, what are the goals of this? Like, what are we trying? Are we looking for more engagement, uh, more monetization, like that kind of stuff? Um, and just getting inspiration from other mobile games on how, how they did that. And we definitely have a lot of QA go into it. And we work with um, like the product managers um, so many meetings, we have like a spec that's written that kind of goes over what the PMs want and then a lot of back and forth, a lot of Slack messages, <laughs> a lot of input from a lot of different teams just to make sure that we understand what they want. And, but we're also thinking about the, like we're kind of like the voice of the user, you know, and so we're like, okay, we understand you want this, but this might not be a good experience for them and just kind of that back and forth. Um, a lot of compromise. Compromise is a big word when we're trying to uh, get the feature locked down. And the great part is, is um, I guess we would call that pre-production for us. And so once all that stuff is kind of nailed down, then you get into all the, um, if you do that part right, then actual production is pretty easy as far as implementation. Um, yeah. You kind of alluded to what a typical day looks like for you. Um, and I wanted to ask of Amber, like, what does your typical day look like? Especially if you're, do you guys always work remotely or did you work in a, like all together pre-COVID? What does it look like now? 
Yeah, so pre-COVID, we definitely all worked together in the office. And for me, transitioning to work from home was one of the hardest things I had to do. Um, because like, I think you realize just how much of your process is people stopping by your desk or you eavesdropping and hearing a conversation being like, whoa, 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 what are we doing, guys? <laughs> um, so like, I think the work from home situation, the biggest thing that changed is there was like an increase in Zoom meetings. So like I have quite a few um, video meetings throughout the day. Um, and like, you know, the biggest, the biggest priority in my life right now is just communication, making sure everybody knows what I know and that um, if somebody mentions something, I really have to pay attention to it because they may have been in a meeting that they thought I was in or they assume I know something. So like, that's a big part of it is like for games to work, like everybody has to be in communication. Everyone has to understand the big vision so that they can do their smaller part in that huge vision. Um, so yeah, it's like a daily, like my day starts with um, a morning stand up with the gameplay group, which is everybody who works on the gameplay mechanics. Um, I kind of get an update from them on how like the new game modes are going, what support they need from my team. And then I have a stand up with the UI team and we kind of go over what's happening on our side and like what we need to do to support. Um, and then after that, it's just tasks and meetings and it's a lot of me talking to engineers. I think I talk to engineers more than designers some days because without engineers, nothing happens. Um, and so like that's something that's really cool about our department is and I've heard it from people in other departments is like we are so tightly connected with our engineers like they are just like if you're on a feature with somebody like you're attached at the hip until it's done. Um, and that's something that just doesn't really happen in other departments. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing. I feel like the UI UX team is super tight because of that. Um, but yeah, and then at the end of the day, like we usually have a play test. And during the play test, we kind of check in at the on the game, see how everything's going. Um, and then there are meetings after the play test for everybody to like give feedback and talk about how they think things are going. So that's a typical day, I think, right, Sydney? Um, it's kind of hard to like boil it down, but yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, Sydney? Uh, no, that definitely is what my day looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I did it. <laughs> uh, there are questions coming in the chat. Andrina or Amanda, are there anything that anything that stands out you want to ask first? Yeah, so I have a good question. Um, let's see. So it seems like most boot camps and UX schools are focused on application and web development. So, or I guess the, the appropriate thing would be app design and web design. So how do you get your portfolio to shine or to get um, game companies to look at you? And I'm gonna add a little bit in here. If you're not taught on how to create um, a user experience for a design or like a game design. I can answer that one. That's very fresh in my mind. Um, so for my program, our final project, we were kind of able to choose whatever we wanted to. And I was like, well, I need to make sure that mine's game specific. Like I wanted to um, make myself look different than everybody else, right? And so I just, I asked around when I, cause I was all already networking, what I was saying earlier, like just talking to a bunch of designers and um, asked them like, what should I do? And they recommended just um, find a game that um, their UI maybe could use a little bit of work and just analyze it and do a little redesign. So my, my final project for my bootcamp was a redesign of, I think it was like the original Mass Effect very, very old game. You might want to choose something more recent just so it's more relevant, but uh, that was just what I ended up choosing. So that's kind of how I made my portfolio more game specific. And then in addition, asking the questions of like, what should I be doing to those people? And um, like I said, like they, they mentioned um, diving into Unity Unreal, just like looking at um, tutorials and stuff like that. That way on your port on your resume, you can say that like, um, I'm currently learning those two 
because having those game engine experiences like that alone will really, really help for sure. Did I hit up everything? Is there anything I missed? I kind of tangent sometimes when I talk, so. No, that was all good. I think like, I think the only thing I'd even add to that, so like I've talked to a lot of UI UX folks who are just like, oh my gosh, I can do this in games. That's so cool. And I'm like, what games do you play? And they're like, I don't. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> um, and it's not like you have to be like Sydney and I, like Sydney has said this to so many people. It's like, you don't have to be the best gamer, but to be a good UI UX designer, you need to understand how to empathize in the medium you are creating for. And if you haven't been frustrated by bad UX in a video game, then like you're not going to understand what you need to do to make good UX in a video game. So I think the thing is, is like, it's a cool job. I love my job. But like, a lot of times when I do play games, it is like research. And it's, you know, there's very few games I get to finish now. Um, and like, I'll play a game that someone at work is talking about just to understand the mechanics and what they're doing. And then I don't have time to finish it or whatever, you know, so like, there is that part piece of it. Like if you want to be a video game UI UX designer and you're not passionate about understanding what a player experience is, then like, I don't know how we can continue a conversation, right? So um, that's just like the one thing. So it's like the barrier to entry is pretty low. It's just show people that you want to solve the problems that are in this space and like give them examples of how you've done that like Stephanie did. And then I have something to talk to you about in an interview. Yeah, and I would say going back to something Stephanie said earlier as well, like it's filled with, it's an industry that's filled with a lot of passion and it's definitely hard to work on something like that if you're not also passionate about it because like Stephanie said, you are really the bridge between the player and the game designer. Um, and if you're going to be that player advocate, you need to understand what it feels like to be the player and you don't have to live in every single person's shoes. We have Reddit for that. But like, you do need to have enough foundational empathy to be able to listen to people on Reddit and be like, okay, they're just mad and okay, that makes sense. And I can see how we can improve here. Um, and I think that there's so much of it that is really an art and you're working on a piece of art. You're creating the UI for a piece of artwork. And we have very little opportunity to talk to the player. And so when we are speaking to the player through our UI, we need to make sure that that's critical information and that, the players gain exactly what they need at the exact moment because we can't control when a player moves through certain areas. Whereas a movie, you're on the rails, you can't pick your story. Um, so it's very important to understand what pieces of information are most important to a player and which ones are secondary and tertiary. And a lot of that comes through practice and just experiencing it on your own. Um, so it's definitely critical to be a part of it. Um, and one metaphor I've been thinking of a lot recently is that working on video games or being a video game designer, UX designer is a lot like um, being like a sports coach, like a basketball or a football coach, where like coaches often have played the game, whether it's professionally or not, they pretty much all have played, for example, football at some point in their lives. And many of them professionally, although they may not have been, you know, the Michael Jordan of their sport. There's very few coaches that are like, hey, I hate football, I just coach because it really becomes such a fabric of your life um, that you need to understand what it's like to be a player in the field and you need to understand what it's like to see the whole schema of the game from above. Um, so yeah, I think working on games is very much like that. Football coaches are not the best football players. Um, they would still be players if they were, <laughs> but they have played the game and that's an important basis for understanding how to lay out plans and execute those plans towards an end goal. So it's very similar in games where there are some people who have been professional games players that we work with. And there are some people that really only play, you know, mobile games on their phone and don't feel like they really can play competitive games or want to play competitive games with their friends. They just want to enjoy and relax in the couple minutes they have. And that spectrum is totally fine, but it is important that you have fallen somewhere on the spectrum. It could even be tabletop games. That's also gaming for the record, but some version of engaging with that experience is really essential for working on the experience. That's awesome. We have so many great questions and that what you guys were just talking about kind of dovetails into the next one. Um, what's a good example of a badly designed game in terms of UX? You don't have to name drop the, the, the person said. I am going to cautiously touch this one. So I saw that question and then I also saw another one about like 
what are games we haven't worked on that have good UI UX. So I think the, the games where it's bad is where, and not everyone's going to understand this reference, but the internet in the 90s, when it feels like the internet in the 90s where there's like a bajillion pop-ups on the screen and they're all flashing and like there's no like application of color theory or hierarchy, that's bad. Um, when the UI is used as a Band-Aid, um, then something in the foundation is wrong. So if you have a game, and like there are games, and I'll list the good ones, there's games um, like the new, the rebooted Tomb Raider, um, The Last of Us, those games don't just rely on the UI to um, affect the user experience. So like, Sydney and I always talk about Tomb Raider, like anything that's interactable, they make it like white. There'll be like white paint on it or something like that. And it's very subtle, but it just draws your eye, it draws you to it. And like, you know, if you go there and like interact with it, something there's some, you're going to find something, you'll be able to climb it, you'll be able to interact with it. So like a big one for me is like, I try really hard whenever I can to work with the environment team or the VFX team and just be like, I don't want to put another icon on the screen. Could you please do something to pull the player this direction. Um, and I think like in campaign games, you have a lot more luxury with that because it's a bit more predictable as to where the player is going to be and when. Um, but yeah, if UI is a Band-Aid, then like something has gone wrong. And there's some folks putting some, <laughs> there some of their own opinions in there, but uh, <laughs> does anybody want to add to that in terms of bad versus good? like examples that people can look to? Yeah, I think for me, it's not like an entire game is bad, if that makes sense. But I have found like certain elements in a game and I will totally name drop because I don't really care. Um, <laughs> um, so cause I, I remember I had an interview for Bethesda at some point and they asked me like, uh, can you name something that you would change? I mean, I don't remember what the exact question was. And I was like, are you sure? Cause like, you don't want to crap on uh, anything that like that studio you're, you're interviewing for it, has made. And I'm like, are you sure? And they go, yeah. So you have to be like really careful about that anyway. Um, and I was kind of telling them there was an example of when you're trying to, um, to put, take stuff in and out of a chest in Skyrim like the the button mapping changed so you could accidentally take all the things out of a chest when you just when you meant to just take one or i forgot the exact details but it was like it was really frustrating because you could have infinite number of items in that chest and then all of a sudden it gets all dumped into your inventory and you're just like i did not want to do that and you have to individually put them back in really 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 bad hated that part um but one thing to consider is there can be some sort of um, limitation, whether it is manpower or time or some sort of um, con constraints that the team was under that you didn't know or understand. And that's why something's done this way. So like whenever in that same interview, they had me go over my case study for the Mass Effect design. And I was talking about how like, why do they do this that way? That's really, really dumb. And they go, and they go, can you think of maybe reasons why this was in this way? And I'm like, well, the game is really old. So maybe the tech could, couldn't really do anything about this. This is the only way they could do it. So just keep in mind that with bad UX or UI stuff that um, there might be a good reason that it's like that, or like a PM really wanted this and designers like, all right, that's what you want, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think I just want to start off with my opinions are my own and not those of my employer. Um, I also will not be name dropping, uh, at least on anything that I don't like. Um, <laughs> but so with that said, um, I would say that like my answers are kind of the same, like two sides of the coin. Um, I think the best UI supports a range of players. Um, and what I mean by that is that you can go from being a new player and being like, hey, I don't even know what buttons do to being a competitive player in a space, whether that means professionally or not. Um, I think like a game that I admire for doing this is Overwatch. They have a great onboarding experience and they have a super vibrant and lively esports world with highly competitive gameplay and a lot of gradient in between. 
Um, and then I think for me personally, at least as a player, a bad UI example would be where I think similar to what Amber said, where you can tell something's a Band-Aid. And just like Stephanie said, like I have no idea what the constraints were that led the team working on this feature to make the decisions that they made. And I have the utmost respect for every UX designer on a video game. But just a case where I could see where it could have been improved. A game I was playing had a action wheel. So you would press a button and a circle of actions would come up onto the screen. And the real advantage of providing that is that instead of having just one button on the screen, you can have 10 around that circle. You can have a lot more buttons. This particular game gave you that action wheel with uh, buttons all inside to open up a second action wheel. So it was double. And for me, that really broke the purpose of the wheel in the first place, which was to say, hey, we have this extra space for all these buttons so that you don't have to press only one button or go into another menu. By having two, for me, it really felt like I was going through a lot of extra button presses that I wasn't getting muscle memory for be able to do a very simple action, which I think was eat in the game. Um, so that would be an example of something that I found personally frustrating as a player. Um, but again, I've definitely worked with those wheels um, on Call of Duty and had similar problems and been like, oh no, are we gonna resort to the double wheel? So there's a lot of things that happen in development for sure. And it's hard to walk the line of how do we cater to all player styles and allow players to grow from new players to advanced players and what are all the actions they want to take and when and how do we show and hide complexity at the various stages. That's great. Uh, let's see, there was a question way back in the chat. Um, are there best practices that you can fall back on to base ideas? Um, and how do you back up your designs? How do you know what is possible? So there's, there's a lot in that question. I don't know who wants to take that one first. Um, I can take it. Let me scroll back just to make sure I'm looking at the right question. Um, when it comes to best practices and how we're making design decisions and I guess some things to rely on when you're making those decisions, um, a big thing is we do lots of play testing. Um, for multiplayer games, for campaign games, story games, we do lots of playtesting and it's very important to look at that feedback as constructive and, and to use that to the best of your knowledge. And that can sometimes mean taking the direct feedback or saying, hey, they were frustrated at this point and thought the game design was terrible, but maybe it's because they didn't see this thing and we need to make that more apparent. Um, so sometimes it's direct feedback and sometimes it's indirect feedback and that's a big one. Um, super helpful in any game. Even if you're making a game on your own, just have your friend play it and you'll learn a lot about what the experience is like for somebody that has never laid eyes on it before. Beyond that though, um, there are definitely, and I think Call of Duty, and will probably agree with me, we benefit from, there have been, I think 18 iterations of the game. So we have a community that we're building off of. So we have a good sense of what our players are expecting. Um, so there's a line, there's I think pillars that we design off of, and one is consistency. So what have our players seen in the past? What are other games doing in this space? Uh, we don't wanna do something that's totally unexpected. We want people to have that muscle memory and enjoy playing the game and have the onboarding process be as short as possible. Um, the other thing is there are certain um, cognitive loads and visual resolution um, data, tidbits that we can use. So we know that players, when they're playing a, a shooter game are only really looking at the very center of their screen. So we know that the most important things that a player needs right now need to be as close to the center as possible. So the whatever the priority is of information, it sort of correlates between edge and center of the screen. Um, cognitive load, we can't expect a player to remember things. We can't expect a player to remember something we told them 10 minutes ago because that's a lot of gameplay time, especially in a multiplayer game. It's a lot of gameplay time to re call that information. Like we want to show players information when it's relevant, not ask them to remember. Um, and then uh, I think the, the third pillar for me, at least, I don't think I'm nearly covering all the pillars that you could rely on, but for me, at least when I'm designing, I think it's just um, the third one would be for best practices is just what is inspiring, passionate, or where do you see passion in other forms of entertainment? Um, so like when we're skinning something and doing the UI art of something for a game, um, like I most recently worked on our Cold War game, which is set during the Cold War, a fictional story during the Cold War. Um, so we looked at, you know, what are people, what did people during that time, what did technology look like? What did texture look like? 
And then also what are the movie representations of that? Because what a lived experience was is different from a remembered experience. So we'll look at the different things that signify that time and really give you that mood and tone that you're craving um, and just see what's exciting and like what movies are coming out, what HBO shows are coming out that people are getting really hyped about and talking about because we wanna tap into that and like, wow, that was really cool because X, Y, Z, how can we bring that into our game or our UI or our art? That was great, thanks. Um, I wanna make sure to ask about um, all those ways to like get into this field. And there was a great question, is coding needed or essential in gaming UX hires? Um, it's not. Um, so like at our, st every studio is different. So there's some studios that are looking for the unicorn where they're just like, you're proficient at coding art and design. Um, they're probably going to work you to death. Be careful. Um, so as far as like our team works, um, we have our engineers who will get into um, like C++ and then like scripting. And then we have our designers and some of our designers will flex into the scripting space, but the engineers don't like them going into C++, right? And then from design, there are some designers who are more on the art side, and then there are some people who are just pure art. Um, uh, like for our team, we are very, like the designers all kind of flex in that space. Um, I am not super technical, but I've worked with engineers long enough that I understand their limitations. And I think that's like the most important part is like, once again, empathy, like have empathy for like, the limitations that they have when they're trying to get your feature in um, and just like understand what will and will not work from their end so that you guys can create the best design possible. That's great. Stephanie, did you did you find that in your career search that the same thing when you went yes, to Zynga? Absolutely. Um, the most that you'll probably need to know is some scripting stuff. Um, and if they're asking for you to be able to code, I, I would also be wary because that's a lot of, you already have a lot of work without coding. That's for sure. Um, just know enough to be able to talk to your engineers and know what is actually possible. They can actually do feasible for the game as well. Um, yeah, my, my answer is much shorter. Definitely don't need to worry about coding uh, to be a designer at Zynga at least. And this might be related, uh, but there was a question. Let me find it. it should, uh, should they still apply to game UX job postings that ask for things like Unity, Unreal, Maya, et cetera? Is that a red flag for UX roles? No, that's no. totally. No good. <laughs> I think we're just going to say, but yeah, I'd expect that. Like, go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's actually really important that you have um, experience in, I don't, I'm not so sure about Maya. I mean, Maya seems more art centered. So I guess it depends on the studio, um, but definitely I'm really nudity. You don't have to like be amazing at it, but just kind of knowing how to navigate it, how like practice maybe building UI in the engine, right? There's plenty of tutorials out there that can help you with that. Um, and you can, if you, feel like you are confident enough in it, you can even put on your resume. But yeah, if they're asking for it, that's very expected for a UX role. Yeah, so like the, uh, like I said, like our, like our whole team flexes. So especially at smaller companies, you won't have the luxury of being like, this one's the designer, this one's the artist, this one's the coder. Um, so there are a lot of times, like I'll get into the editor um, for Call of Duty, which be, would be the equivalent of Unreal and Unity. Um, these things are super easy to learn, like Unreal and Unity. Like if you learn those, like they're all on the internet. There's They're free. There's tutorials. Like it's totally something you can do on your own. Um, and just like be honest during like the interview conversation, just be like, well, I've gotten into it, but I would need more training on it because um, they're really easy to train people up on. But just understanding the basic principles of a game engine would be like huge. And then a question just came in that kind of is related to that about since you don't necessarily need to know coding, 
where can you learn those basic concepts to be able to communicate with engineers and understand what's possible in the game engine? Like, where do you start? And I know you mentioned a couple of books and we had a few people come in late. So if you need to repeat, totally cool. I have a Sphero. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if anyone's familiar with what this is. I don't know if I have it on my shelf. It's this little robot ball and it was designed for children. Um, I don't know where it is right now, but it's this little robot ball designed for kids and you can sync it to your iPad and um, it basically, I think it's someone in the chat, correct me, but I think it teaches you like basic JavaScript language and that kind of stuff. So it, but it teaches you like code from like a building blocks kind of visual perspective. Um, so like if you don't have any engineers to talk to, that's definitely the way to do it. Um, the way that you know, I onboarded to speaking to engineers was getting an internship and then just talking to engineers constantly. Like one thing you'll find with engineers um, is that you'll be like, hey, I want to do this crazy thing. And they'll be like, no. And then you'll be like, OK, but it would be cool. And then you kind of go away and then they come back and they're like, I found a solve for that. And here's how we're going to do it. So like asking them like about their process and like how they're doing it will help you with like further down the line. Um, but yeah, it's like speaking to engineers the best way. But if you want to understand a little bit about like basic coding, um, there's a lot of resources online too. You can learn for free. Um, it's all just like self-starter stuff, um, which is like kind of hard to do. I know when we all have jobs in school to add another thing to our list. <laughs> yeah, I know in the boot camp that um, I teach that we teach conversational code specifically, knowing that designers. We're not going to actually go out and do something that's production level necessarily, but at least to be able to have a conversation because even, even it, you know, if you're not working uh, with games, it's super important to be able to talk to an engineer about what they're doing so that you can have a product, like say something that they're like, they're not like, oh, whatever. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Right. So was that your experience too, Sydney? It was just learning to talk to engineers. Yeah, I mostly just ask engineers. Um, I also took a couple coding classes um, and most of our Call of Duty stuff is proprietary, um, but it's the it's closest to working in C++. Um, so basic knowledge of that is super helpful. Um, I see that there is a follow up to this question as well. Um, I don't mean the basics of coding. I meant the specifics of what game engines are realistically capable of. Um, and then also the universe, Unity versus Unreal. Um, definitely correct me if I'm wrong, guys. As far as Unity versus Unreal, I would say both. Um, there is no, I would say to me, that question is almost like saying XD or Figma. Um, go find people that work in both games that function on both. Um, and I wouldn't expect any interviewer to look down on one over the other or pick an applicant because they worked in one or the other. And similarly, I would say just practicing in one of those will give you an idea of what the game engines are capable of. Um, working at Raven Software, like I said, we do work on proprietary tools. We don't work on one of these public facing ones. And there are studios that do work on the public facing ones. There are studios that don't. Um, it really just depends on where you're applying, um, what their experience will be. So having just like Amber said, a basic knowledge of coding, a basic knowledge of one of these engines will get you so far in any interview and in any job. Um, if you know a ton of Unity, it's not a huge onboarding process to get over to Unreal and vice versa, just like XD and Figma. Um, some of the shortcuts might be slightly different, but the goal is the same of each product. So how you get there is gonna be, like it's gonna be an easy onboarding process. It's just about knowing a little bit of at least one of them. Yeah, just for some perspective on the engine, it really depends on the engine that the company is using, what the engine is capable of. Um, and like when I was working at this indie studio, there's a period there where we're doing a lot of outsourcing and I was using a different end game engine for like every six months for a solid two years. So, um, and it was just, it was just always kind of like you go into the next one and it's just like, okay, does this one accept Targas or can I bring PNGs into it? Like, can I, does it have a UI editor where I can set stuff up or do I need to give the engineer like coordinates so he can set it up for me, um, he or she. But so it's, yeah, so it's, it just, it's all, it just depends. And um, don't think that like, oh, I don't know all of them. I can't apply for this because I learned Unreal and they use Unity. Um, 
a, a decent studio is willing to onboard you to their tools. So. Yeah, and to speak more about how the capabilities depend on where you are, a great example is um, Zynga uses Unity. I double check, I'm allowed to say that in public. Um, so, but it's not like Unity vanilla that you like as a like single person that you would just like download it on your own because we have tech artists, right? And they will add all these different scripts to Unity to um, give, give us tools, right? And it, like, it's even project specific. So um, I'm working on a match three game that just came out in September as Harry Potter puzzles and spells. So the Harry Potter team, like the, the version of Unity we use is very different than both vanilla Unity and maybe what like our slots team is using, if that makes sense. Cool. Oh my gosh, so many good questions. Um, let me see, which one should I ask next? Um, let me go back up way up to 622. <laughs> Hopefully Rob is still here. Yeah, you're still here. Hey, Rob. Do you see friction between the user experience for fun and the monetization strategies that F2, uh, F2P games often require? So just for context for um, that acronym, F2P is free to play. Um, and that's a model generally where the game is free to play, you can download it for free, and the company essentially makes money by selling um, like skins for your characters or upgrades. Um, a battle pass is a really common one. You buy a battle pass every season. Um, so anyway, with that out of the way, my, I guess, somewhat sassy answer to that is not if it's done well. Um, I think kind of like what Amber said earlier about what bad UI can look like. If a game is saying you can only play by paying or you can be, I mean, some of these might be opinions, um, but if you can only play the game by paying, even if it's a small amount for every round, or if you can win the game more often by paying for better upgrades than another player may be able to pay for, um, things like that, I think make a game feel bad and not fun and feel frustrating. Uh, and they don't uphold the competitive integrity that some players at least are looking for. Um, but I think a good free to play model where you know you can get cosmetic things like a battle pass often offers or um, money to spend in game, things like that, I think can work really well where a player can still engage with content that may, they may not otherwise be able to afford. A great example is for Call of Duty, our regular game costs $70 and we do have a free to play option um, so for a lot of players, $70 is an inhibitor um, and they cannot pay that. So having a free to play option where they may be able to still join that community and hang out with their friends is a great setup. Um, and I think that's super valuable in the world. But again, it has to be done right. And everybody's always working on that. Of course, it's not to judge any free to play, but I think that there's friction when it's done poorly and when players can't engage with the content they want to engage with. That's great. Uh, Maggie asked, um, I see that typical UX roles are more focused on solving problems or focused on some sort of profitable company ROI. Is that any different in games UX? What do you decide to work on next? And then there is silence. Like, yeah. Amber's gonna do it. Yes. Well, no, because you just asked, like, what do you decide to work on next? And I was like, oh my God, the list is so long. Um, yeah, that's, I think, like, the, so it's a balancing act because we need to make sure that we are maintaining. So, like, I work on the free to play, like, live product. So, like, that is, we need to make, and then like Sydney can speak to the, a campaign experience, but like we need to make sure that we're maintaining what we already have and that we're adding enough new content to keep them engaged in the next thing. And then um, Sydney has been leading an effort to incorporate accessibility features in the game. And so now we have that piece as well that um, to make this like well-rounded product. Um, and so like it is definitely a balancing act to make sure we're never leaning one way too far. Um, and like deciding what goes into the game next is just a lot of communication with your teammates and being like, all right, what's valuable to you? What's valuable to the players? What's valuable to the stakeholders? And um, if you're making an indie game, then you don't have to worry about stakeholders because it's just you doing this in your garage. But um, 
that's not the reality of a lot of games. It's like you need to consider all of these facets to it. Um, and like, yeah, so I think it's just like a huge team effort. Like I have a very spongy, empathetic soul. And so like, I just want to do things for the player all the time. So I need to have one of my producers who I go to and I'd be like, this is my priorities. And he's just like, okay, but we also need to do this stuff. I'm like, yes, thank you. We do need to do that. So it's just about like finding your crew of people who have different perspectives from you to make sure that you're accounting for everything that the game needs to be successful. I hope that answered that question. I just went whew, on a tangent. <laughs> I thought it sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back into the career realm. I'm trying to balance the wanting to get down in the weeds of games and also how to actually help people get into this industry that they're interested in. So Ryan asked, would it be possible to get an internship or even possibly start working before completing a UX degree? Or is it a, is it a better idea to just finish the degree first? Because he's only taken two classes and he has 10 more to go. What would you suggest? always go for an internship as soon as possible. Um, make sure you like this. <laughs> um, and uh, like going for the internship, I think, you know, like Sydney talked about her internship earlier. Like, I remember when she came in for her internship, before I met her, they handed me her resume and I was like, I'm not like responsible enough to be this person's intern like she has she's majoring in theoretical physics like what do you do like I went to a super tiny college next to a mall like I can't and like so just like seeing her experience of coming in and doing an internship at a game company and how it changed her life and totally like altered her like course um I think that's like super important for people to have and like when I did my internship I realized that like I don't have to make Pixar movies because these people are super fun to work with and video game problems are way more interesting than animation problems um so yeah definitely do that make sure that it's something that you like and then also absorb as much as you can on that internship and network like if you do take an internship talk to everybody that you're working with um, and do not be shy Stephanie, do you want to add to that? You're like, yeah. Yes, yes. All I could think about is I was always really jealous because um, Blenna Blizzard is one that has um, a lot of internships, but like you actually have to be enrolled like in an undergraduate degree and I wasn't and I was like, oh, I can't apply for that. Uh, but yeah, experience is going to be better than any, I mean, not better. As far as getting into the industry, it's going to be more valuable, I think, getting experience over um, the education piece like it's obviously very important for the like learning the foundations and the concepts and stuff but until you're doing it you're not gonna know if you like it and then uh don't waste your time like especially in this industry like they, they were mentioning before there's a lot of really passionate people like um being a designer in the game industry is gonna pay less than um design um anywhere else out there just because like people just would, I mean, maybe not work for free, but they're willing to take that pay cut just because what we do is maybe a little bit more fun, depending on who you ask. So yes, internships now, 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 now. And for those of you that came in a little after my intro, just to let you know, Stephanie Sarvis is a rotational experience designer at Zynga. Amber Hulkenbrink is a, an associate UX uh, UI lead working on the Call of Duty franchise for Raven Software. And Sydney works with her. She is a UX designer at Raven Software. So just to kind of, for those of you that joined us um, a little after the very beginning of our program. You know, there's been a little bit of a chatter about accessibility. Um, how, like, if you guys want to kind of look at, like, what kinds of accessibility challenges are, are you all facing um, in terms of your work? Are you addressing it at all? Um, who want, maybe Sydney or so many want to take that one because that is a big topic I know. This is my bread and butter. This is one of the big things I lead for Call of Duty. So I'm happy to talk about this topic. Um, <laughs> so for accessibility in Call of Duty, um, it depends on what part of the game we're talking about, where exactly our focus is. Um, so we do story parts of the game campaign, as well as multiplayer. Um, and the needs are different there. Um, 
But some big pillars of what we think about are, I saw something about colorblindness in the chat. I just wanna say some of these accessibility features that I'll mention um, will not be as focused on some basic accessibility. And by basic, I mean colorblind filters, subtitles, things of that nature. We work in a game engine every year for Call of Duty that's pulled forward with us. Things like subtitles live in that game engine already. We don't have to remake that every year. We do have to make it better every year, but we're not recreating it from scratch. Um, so there are things like colorblind filters that apply for the entire screen that we do have in game. And that does not mean that we're perfect on colorblindness. A colorblind filter over the entire screen does not work as well as us picking colorblind friendly colors. But I will just skim over the things that we already have into what we're thinking about improving on, what we are working on improving on, and where we're looking in the future. Um, for Call of Duty, there's a couple different things that are top of mind. Um, one is going to be ability inclusion, of course. And so that will be things like colorblindness. Can a player play with an Xbox adaptable controller? Can a player play the game with only one hand? Um, and the different contexts of ability. So that can be temporary. I'm holding a baby in one hand. I'm playing a game in another hand. Um, that can be I broke my arm, so I just can't play with that arm. And that can be permanent. Um, Something that's really important is for, just as an example to throw a number out there, for Call of Duty Warzone, which is the product that Amber is leading UX for, we have surpassed 80 million players. Um, and that means that over 20, is either over 20 or over 25 million of those players are currently playing with an ability uh, inclusion concern. Um, so that can include colorblindness, that can include total physical disability um, and everything in between. So this is definitely something near and dear to our hearts and the hearts of our players that we do advocate for. Um, and it's something that we have a long way to go on as well. We are definitely not you know, the gold standard, um, but we're working on it. So I think a big one is ability inclusion and how do we let players remap their controllers or change what their HUD looks like or change the colors that they're playing with, things of that nature. Um, a second pillar is how do we culturally be culturally inclusive and diverse? Um, Call of Duty is a military simulator. This means inherently we're already living on the edge of violence because um, we are portraying it. And that involves portraying violence in cultural contexts that we don't, that we have to navigate carefully. Um, whether or not it's a fictional story, we're putting the player in other countries and other spheres and other cultures. And we need to make sure that we're respecting those cultures even while we represent them, um, no matter what the history of the time was. Um, a great parallel to this is we have documentaries about slavery in the United States where we don't use uh, racial slurs to refer to the folks in that documentary. That is the same line we need to walk with our games, which is we want to properly represent that historical period, that battle, that culture, whatever it is in that case. But we need to make sure that we're culturally sensitive, that we're not hurting people unnecessarily, and that we're providing an experience that is fun and not harmful. Um, so how we illustrate the worlds and create the characters is really important. And then branching off of that, the third big one is diversity and how that works with accessibility. We wanna make sure that our players see characters and personalities uh, and physiques in the game that represent themselves and represent the people they admire and show them that you know you can be XYZ physique, XYZ personality, and you can be that cool military character taken on the world. Like you don't have to be, uh, forget the stereotype, but you don't have to be a 30 year old super buff white dude with brown hair to be like the cool guy that's like saving the world and you don't have to be a guy. Um, so I, I know that diversity isn't always included in accessibility, but for us, we do include those initiatives very close to each other because they have so much tied, there's so much empathy and passion there, at least from the developer side, where those for us are very tied together. So looking at what our characters look like, what our characters act like, what our characters' uh, backgrounds are, those are all very important initiatives. And it's super important when you're working on accessibility in games to look at these in the moment after deciding what a game is going to be generally, and before you decide, at least for us, where the battles are going to happen. Because for example, if we're gonna say, we really want a person from this cultural context to be one of our main characters, we wanna make sure that the battle that we're showing shows off that cultural context in a way that's exciting and authentic to that character. 
we don't want to like pigeonhole a character into a battle that doesn't really make sense and they wouldn't have actually been there for because it's not as powerful of a story and we always want to make sure that our stories are authentic and cool and make you want to come back and play more with your friends so for us accessibility is super near and dear um, and it's ability inclusion cultural inclusion and diversity inclusion in the game um, and the best example I have for accessibility action items that we've taken recently is we, as I said, always have had subtitles. Um, it's native to our engine at this point. It gets pulled forward into every game. One thing we've done this year is change the colors of the, uh, the speakers of a line, have a different color than the text after that. So it'll say like John Doe in bright green or something. We made sure that those colors are all uh, colorblind friendly, even without the filters. Um, we have made the text variable size. So we have our base size and then it can be large or jumbo. Um, and we made sure that it doesn't overlap anything on our HUD while it's zoomed in. And then the backings to it can be 0% opaque, so they can be transparent, or they can be 100% opaque or anywhere in between. 100% uh, opaque, opaque would be jet black. So you can set that backing. Uh, I know Red Dead 2 also does this. You can set that backing to be any gradient that helps you see what that text looks like. Um, so that's an example of how we would actually take accessibility forward into the game and the kinds of things that we work on when we're thinking about ability inclusion. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> I think I think it's awesome. That's so great. I wanted to ask Stephanie on, on the Zynga side, what are you all, how do you all address accessibility in the games that you've been working on, at least from your new perspective to the company? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if it's just because I'm just starting and so I haven't really encountered it yet. Um, but the only thing I could think of as far as like the inclusion side of things, we I know that uh, Zynga prides itself on the games being social. Like we want you and your friends to play. We want your grandma playing. Like, so they, they try to design things that can appeal to people of all age types. And I know that we have localization. For, I don't know how many countries it is, but it's a lot of countries. A lot of what I do, what I was doing earlier was fixing loc bugs, like, because Russian and Japanese are just so much longer than English. It's crazy. Um, and trying to get it all on a mobile screen, it's a great challenge. Um, but it's, uh, other than that, um, I'm actually not sure. I don't, I need to actually ask the team about that as far as, you know, I, the color decisions that you use. I know that we do like really bright, exciting colors, especially when we want you to click on something like here's the play button, this is really bright green. Um, anything, I don't know, other than that, I need to look more into. We, we just gave you some homework. <laughs> yeah, when you first asked the question, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, what do we do? I gotta think about that, so thank you. <laughs> oh, let me see. Oh, that was so good. I was so lost in the accessibility subject that, um, oh, I don't know, Amber, do you want to add to that at all? Oh, hell no. Sydney covered all of it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why she's in charge of it. <laughs> that's like, I think that's one thing with um, accessibility and inclusion is like not everybody like should be expected to be an expert in it. But when you find someone who is, put them in charge of it and let them drive it. Um, and so that's what Raven has done with Sydney is like everyone was just like no 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 put her in charge of this she has the experience with it and like um, I don't know about it as much as she does she educates me all the time um, so yeah I think it's just getting out of people's ways like a big part of accessibility just letting them solve those problems yeah there was a question earlier about how early are UX designers involved in a game's creation from planning or later on, how did the UX teams get assigned to specific sections of the game? I think this depends uh, studio to studio. So I can just talk about my experience um, because also because we're a mobile game. So UI is pretty much involved in everything that they wanna do. Um, so we're included pretty early on. I think uh, like the feature owner will kind of Right, like I mentioned earlier, they have a spec, right? So they'll think about what they want, all the all the weird requirements, um, and we'll have a, the spec review, like the first thing we do. And um, UI is involved in that very first meeting, and that's where we can kind of ask a lot of questions and get clarification on things. 
So yeah, short answer is right away. <laughs> Um, for us, it's very early as well. And that's like when you're interviewing places, that's a great question to ask is like where the UI UX comes in on the pipeline. Um, because the company I used to work for when I first started there, it was literally the last thing. Um, and I saw a question go by earlier where it was like, well, who used to do the UI and the UX before there were UI UX designers, which is a great question. So like, um, it was usually a gameplay designer who was like, well, I've got some time today, so I'll put the menu in. And then I would just reskin it with art. I wasn't really in charge of the layout or deciding what was on the screen or what would be on the next screen or what the flow would be. I had nothing to do that with that. It was a gameplay designer who did it in like their limited spare time. Um, and so like, I think it's, it's great, like a big part of me wanting to work at Raven was just how involved the UX team was with the gameplay designers. We have to work very closely with them because our job is to make sure that their vision for the player experience is communicated properly. Um, you wanna make sure that wherever you're working, the UI UX isn't treated as an outsourcer or like siloed away for the, from the rest of the team. They really need to be integrated in it. Um, but yeah, so that's just, you should be at the start of it if you wanna make good UI UX for games. There was a there was a good question. Um, there were a couple questions that were somewhat related. I wanted to ask first: um, Are you still using like Sketch, XD, Figma to build your UI, or do you primarily use Unity, Unreal, or whatever your proprietary system is? Yes, <laughs> I have Sketch, XD, and Figma, all my work computers. So um, definitely, I actually today I just uh, presented a prototype in XD to, to the stakeholders because um, from there, uh, you know, when you when you're making these design decisions, it's a lot less expensive to do it time wise to do it in a prototyping tool like Sketch, XD, or Figma than it is to get stuff implemented in your game engine. And then uh, at that point, it's pretty much too, not too late, but basically it's like, it's too late. Like we've already spent so much time in here. So definitely prototyping in there. Um, but I know that we, there might still be some great boxing that you can do in Unity as well, but we definitely um, like to do it in prototyping tools first. Seeing some nods from Sydney and Amber. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> do it like the all that hap we do it where it can be as cheap as possible and quick on iteration. Um, our engine, like a good UI UX engineer understands iteration, but you really don't want to make them do a bunch of stuff twice. <laughs> you don't have to. Right, exactly. Um, how how does your company using Unity affect, um, how, let me see if I can, Camilla, you might have to jump in with this. I don't know that I'm saying this correctly. How does your company using Unity affect you as their UX designer? Yeah. You all, I don't did really, I say it right? I don't really know how to word the question. I'm just, <laughs> sorry. Um, here, let me turn my camera on so it's less awkward. Um, hi. So. Uh, the reason I'm asking is because I just started at a really small um, startup and they're a kids app that teaches kids um, Spanish through storytelling and all of their stories and like the games within the stories are created in Unity. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a game, not really. Um, and our developer is like a, he, he's a gamer. And so is like our creative director. We're a really small team, we're a team of six. And so um, I don't use Unity, they do. I just create um, my prototypes and my mockups in Figma. And then they, you know, after testing and figuring out like the final iteration, they recreate my mockups within Unity. So I was just wondering if any of you actually used Unity, if y'all were like past that step or if, I mean, you just answered that question. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, in, ad in addition to prototyping in like Figma or whatever, uh, we're also expected to um, go into Unity and actually build out the stuff as well. So. Okay, yeah. So there you go, Camilla. You're going to have to start building it. <laughs> but it, it, it could be different, right? So like that's just what we do here. Yeah, that's cool. So did, did you have to learn Unity to work there? Or you, you, they taught you? 
Yeah, my my experience is actually pretty unique in the sense that I'm not an intern because like I'm a full time person, but I so my role is rotational experience designer, right? So basically I'm six months on one team and then I'm gonna be six months on another one. And so you get a full year of like this, you, everything's more focused on like learning. So because my role is very entry level, they're like, okay, you, you kind of know Unity, but you're not expected to be an expert, right? So there's still um, like this feature that I'm working on right now, um, like I said, we just, uh, we're working on sending stuff to the licensor and then once that gets approved, um, I'm going to, for the first time, actually be building this feature like in Unity um, with, with uh, a senior I'm paired with. So even though I have a little bit of experience doing my own projects, like this will be the first like um, big thing, but it just depends. Entry level, they'll probably want knowledge of it, but they don't expect you to be like, amazing um a skill can be taught a skill can always be taught that's great um let's see what do your teams look like do you work with a team that is mostly a ux designers do you also work with artists developers and i think amber you kind of talked about the fact that you have a variety of skills on your your team um do you want to elaborate anything on how, how you split up the roles and how you make sure that you, everybody's working in harmony? Yeah, I think um, like we could talk a bit more about like how we all apply our skills. Um, and I want Sydney to speak to this too, because you totally had a different dynamic um, when you were working on campaign than I did with Warzone. So with Warzone, um, it was me and two other designers and they were a bit more technical than I was. And so like, basically what we did is um, we would, there would be more than enough features for all of us to work on. So I would take one game mechanic feature and buddy up with a UI engineer and then like gameplay engineer and then the gameplay designer and work with them to make sure that we got like the design right, um, the right like art that we needed in game and then everything implemented. And then like the other two designers I worked with, they did the same thing. They So like, you're not really working, like we all work together and we all like keep each other informed as to what we're doing. But like when you're really in it on a feature, like we were very like into the gameplay realm of things. Um, and so that's kind of how we broke stuff up on the Warzone side where um, there was like new features going in like every few weeks. Um, so it was kind of like strike teams would form and then they would disperse and then you would form a new one over here. Um, so that's kind of how it went on my side of things. Yeah, and I can definitely talk to the campaign side. And I think what's really valuable about the fact that my experience is different from Amber, even though we're on the same team, is that it shows that how the UX team is structured at various studios is going to be totally different for every studio. And it's definitely something you should ask about in an interview. Um, and I don't think that there's anything that comes to mind as a red flag. It's just how do you like working? Um, I think the only red flag for me is if you are the only UX designer, that can be really tough. But um, my experience on campaign is different because a campaign game uh, for Call of Duty means we essentially have three years to make it and then we ship the game and we're hands off, pencils down, done. Whereas the game that Amber works on, um, they release new patches every, I think it's two weeks, something like that. Um, so they're constantly evolving the game. Whereas for campaign, we have this huge amount of work instead of just two week sprints, this huge amount of work, and then we pencils down. So we have a different structure on our side. So for campaign, essentially, um, we had three people working on it for the UX team. And one was very artistic, um, one was very technical, and then I, was very much on the design side. So for campaign, instead of having it be like each person takes a feature or takes a bite out of this cookie and takes it all the way through, it would be I did all of the design work. My one coworker put everything into the game, the one that's more technical, and the third coworker reskinned everything with the proper UI art to make everything feel cohesive and unified. Um, 
So we had a different work style on two sides of the fence, even on the same team. Um, it depends on the project and the kind of dev cycle that you're in. So in that case, it would just be we a similar thing. We know we have this pool of features we need to create within the next three years. So let's just start taking bites out of this. So I'd work on a design. I would then hand that off to the person to implement it. Um, my more technical coworker, he would put it into the game. We would get eyes on it, so play testing and QA, and get that information back and iterate on the functionality. And then the third coworker would go through everything more towards the end of the process and make sure that it looked artistic and cool and fun. So that was our structure. And it sounds like Stephanie, you described a really interesting structure, the way that Zynga puts together their, their entry level teams and how you work, you're paired with senior uh, designers as well, right? Did I get that correct? Yeah, kind of. It's, uh, they're, they're really, they've been really good, at least my team specifically, has been good about making me feel like I'm just a regular associate or just des a UX designer on their team. Like, I don't feel like entry level. I mean, I do, but not as far as a team aspect, I don't. Um, every, every studio and every team is going to be different. Like they mentioned, uh, earlier because that's part of why they want you to rotate in this program is so um, when I in six months or six months so February six months from August I think it's February when I switch to my other team it's going to be a completely different uh, structure as um, who like how how the, the the teammates are structured and maybe even their pipeline of how they do things um, so I can only speak to the Potter team there's five of us right now. And we all kind like I think all of our our skill sets are pretty equal. Like we we all do everything. Um, maybe some are more artistically inclined than others, uh, but we all do bug fixing, we're all working in prototyping stuff, uh, we're all we're all working in Unity. And I think I think the idea is is how work is divvied up is like feature. So uh, this new feature is um, coming up in the pipeline. Um, we're going to assign it to this person, and then maybe there'll be two people assigned to the same one if it's a really, really big feature. So that's kind of how that's structured. I wanted to quickly uh, ask Sherry's question for my own curiosity as well. What does gameplay <laughs> mean? Could you guys could define what that is? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so UI UX, obviously, we handle the the HUD, the menus, all of that stuff. Um, so gameplay, they are designing the game modes and like the game mechanics and the interactions. So like they decide, um, like in Warzone, um, the gameplay engineers, like we have a, a mode out right now that's a zombies mode. Um, I'm glad it's out so I can talk about it finally. But um, so like the gameplay designers, they designed that game. Um, and then the engineers, which at our studio are more like designers, they are kind of very special beings where they can code and design an experience. So they decided, you know, like, well, this is how much health the zombie has. And this is like when you get a headshot with a zombie, like it'll do this instead of if it was a regular human. And like, this is how they come back to life. And so they're like making the rules for the, the world, essentially, like, um, I've like used this analogy with Sydney before, like they get to decide what the gravity is in that world and they decide how heavy things are, like how light they are, like they're kind of the creators of the whole experience. Um, and then everybody else is kind of supporting the gameplay designers and engineers vision, whether it's UI, audio, visual effects, um, the environment team, the lighting team, um, we all work together to build the world that they are manifesting. So I don't know, Sydney, if like on the campaign side, if there's like more stuff to add to that definition. No, I would say it's very much what Amber said. The gameplay designers set up the rules of the world and how you're gonna run around and, and what your goal is. And like, I'm gonna, sh in our game, I'm gonna shoot all the people and kill the bad guy and save the world. UI is like, how do we tell them how much ammo is left in their gun and how much health they have and where they are on the map. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to ask a May's question in a little bit, but at first, because there's been a couple questions about how you handle UX research, and that was actually on my boilerplate of questions too. Like, what does user research look like in, in your world? I guess my first question on that, I'm returning with a question. So when they say user research, is that like user research on something we've already designed, something before we get started, or I'm just curious. I can touch on a couple bit of it, but. Maggie, do you want to jump in and elaborate on what you're wondering? Is Maggie here? She probably doesn't want to jump in. Um, I think there was a question about usability testing as well, which usually is on a current product or feature. So I guess that's just the question, like, do you go and talk to like the players and get feedback on a game after it's been released? And then what do you do, what do you do with all any, any kind of user input in terms of like deciding like what happens? Cause I know you all do a lot of the play yourself and I know you, um, also are, you know, getting inspiration from other places and trying to place yourselves in this, you know, with the, with an empathetic kind of viewpoint, but it'd be interesting to know, like, do you gather input from the players themselves? Yeah, we definitely do. And like, once again, it's different um, for Warzone because we can gather input from the, the world because it's out there and we have the ability to adjust and change things. Um, and that's something that's really cool. And then sometimes it's kind of overwhelming at the same time, but um, like we do have that luxury where we can like kind of throw something out there, see how it goes. And then we can iterate based on feedback. Um, I don't know how many people watch Twitch streamers, but oh my goodness, like we get a lot of issues from that. And then like, I know Sydney has said it like facetiously, but Reddit is just like, you know, we take a look at it. Of course we have to like, remember too, that those are just like the vocal ones. There could be people that are having issues that we're not seeing too, right? So it's, so there is that where you kind of have to like, um, it's, it's interesting parsing that live information. Um, and then like, if we are putting, certain features in the game and we have time to a b test it like we'll definitely go through that process um but a lot of our like internal testing like when it comes to like game modes and things like that like that is like we will determine in the play tests um how that's going for our product and it you know you do have to be cautious like you got to make sure you're not being biased with it so there'll be times where like if I play a game mode and I'm just like, that was super rough, like I'll skip a couple days of that game mode just so I can come back with a fresh perspective. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it all depends on what we're testing, how the usability testing goes. Um, yeah, and I can just add, as Amber was mentioning, things are different for Warzone versus campaign because again, they're just different development cycles. And like I said, when we're pencils down, it's kind of like we can't really like fix things in the same way. Um, so our user research does look different on the campaign side. Um, and essentially what happens is we have a user research team at our, our studio is owned by Activision, Blizzard King. Um, and so at the Activision level, we have a user research team and they essentially go to each studio and help each studio out. Um, for whatever project they're working on. So when we know that we're working on this campaign, we say, hey, like we need people to come play test this and they will hire external people. Um, we do also play test ourselves, but they'll hire external people that have never seen the game before um, to come and play the game or a couple levels. And then we'll get feedback surveys essentially based on that. And we can act or not act on that feedback. Um, we do also play it ourselves. So essentially since half of our team works with uh, the product that Amber is talking about Warzone and half is on campaign. We will have people from the other half that haven't ever seen campaign play it because it's super easy to just have somebody come over to a cube, sit down and play the game. And we have a formalized process for that as well. And then in terms of, you know, especially working on Call of Duty, because we know essentially that we'll be making another Call of Duty in the future because we make one every year. Um, we do uh, do essentially a postmortem of user research. Um, so that's a collection of you know, Twitch streamers, players, feedback, 
um, solicited in all kinds of ways, as well as looking at data hooks that we've put into the game. So we may be looking at how many times a player turned this setting on and kept it on, how many players interacted with this menu, used that weapon, selected that character. Um, another really common one that a lot of games, a lot of shooter games do, is we will look at the maps that we created and see where players stood on the maps, where players killed other players on the maps, and where players died on the maps. So we will see these heat maps and be able to determine, okay, players are not ever going to this area of the map. Why is that? Do we need to change that? Can we change that now? Or is that for the next game? So we definitely have post-mortem looks at the data of how players interacted with the game and also how they're talking about the game. Um, and just to build off of Amber's point, because I made that joke about Reddit, um, we do look at, I always have streamers playing uh, in the background while I'm working, we do look at Reddit. Um, we do have teams specifically dedicated to looking at that community feedback. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when you're working on games or thinking about working on games and, and looking at those resources to see what kinds of feedback games may be getting. Um, Statistically, Reddit is a vocal minority of our player base. Very few of our players actually post on Reddit. Um, so sources like that are interesting to see where people are getting most frustrated or most excited about the game, but they are not a good um, data point, if that makes sense. It's a good hint at what we might want to look at, but it's not a good thing to say we're going to change the game based on this post. Yeah, there's just um, also like we both play the game in live too so like we'll notice things and like just like an anecdote from when we first released warzone um i placed a certain button in a certain menu in a spot and we had like a heated argument about it and i was like nope it'll be better if it's here for all these reasons blah blah blah, blah. and then it went live and three days later i had to go into work and be like I was wrong. We need to move it over here. And it was because like I played the game and like was listening to random players and they could not figure out what they were supposed to do. And I was like, damn it. So we play the game too. And like we care enough to go to work and change it as soon as we can when we mess up. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I was reminded of the fact that I'll walk through the living room sometimes and my son will be uh, watching YouTube videos of Minecraft and it goes on for hours and hours. So I thought I'd ask this question. <laughs> um, any suggestions for popular or great uh, game UX people to follow on YouTube or podcasts? I'm gonna post the game summit link in the chat again I posted it earlier podcasts for okay so one podcast that I love just for games in general is um what's good games I really enjoyed that one I highly recommend it um but yeah I I haven't gotten into too many podcasts I think Sydney's got a good list of streamers but what was there's one we just discovered is butters is that the one Oh yeah, Butters, she's a streamer. Yeah, she's none of the streamers I watch, including Butters, are um UX specific. They're not playing yeah. the games to look at the UX, but um it's honestly more valuable to see players not thinking about the UX mm -hmm. uh streaming because most of the player base is not thinking about the UX. They're just getting frustrated. So it's best to see the organic frustration, if that makes sense, or confusion. Um Another podcast I've been trying to get into uh, that's newer is the Game Dev Show, um, but I don't know if it's good. So that's one on my list in case anybody wants to check it out. I can think of one YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's called Game Makers Toolkit. It's not UX yes. specific, but that's a good one. Um, I know that there's at least been one or two episodes where they were specific about UX. And I was like, oh, cool. Um, and there is another one. What is it? I think it's called Playframe. The the guy who runs that one, um, I think he used to be on Game Makers Toolkit and then he branched off. He's an animator though, so he when he plays games, a lot of it's just for fun. But sometimes he will animate, uh, talk about animation and stuff in the game too, which could be kind of cool if you're interested in that. Macadamia nuts. Hmm? You want one? 
All right, let's see. Let me ask it. Okay, I was I needed to ask a May's question. What advice do you have for women who are a little nervous about navigating the game industry? Uh, what should she look for in a gaming company's culture to be certain that they respect people of all backgrounds? And how can she be reassured that they can follow up on that? I'm going to nominate Sydney for this. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, I feel like this is a tough one because um, it's just nerve wracking. Um, and I think my biggest advice is sort of, it's not really proactive advice, but I would just say always be prepared to stand up for yourself and leave a situation that's toxic. Um, I have had a great experience at Raven Software um, where other women are empowered, other folks of other identities are empowered whether they're normative or not, cisgender or not. Um, but I would say that one thing I think going into the industry, I felt, um, and one of the reasons, I guess, let me say this first. One of the reasons I left physics was because of um, sexual discrimination, gender discrimination um, that just became overwhelming. So coming from that toxic arena and going into games, I definitely was nervous. I was kind of putting myself back into the same situation that I had just been in. Um, because to be frank, going into a video game studio, it's a lot of um, cis normative white males wearing khaki shorts with black t-shirts and flip flops. Um, so like, you know, it's stressful and there is a lot of diversity um, improvements in the gaming industry and, and we do try to hire more diverse folks and but it is still overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly white and cis normative um, but it's not always a bad thing um, we have great leadership at Raven that really embraces like I talked about before diversity inclusion accessibility inclusion ability inclusion lots of different things and puts folks that may not be able to stand on their own onto the platform they need to be on I've been pulled onto platforms for sure to be able where my male coworkers have augmented my voice and agency um, and asked me to speak and to lead uh, in ways that I didn't even trust that I could on my own. So I think, you know, when you're in a space, also be watchful of that. You know, when you do have coworkers, whether they're male or not, when you do have coworkers that are saying, oh, that's awesome, this person did that, Sydney did that, she worked on this, go talk to her. That's a great small thing that happens in everyday life where you know that those coworkers are supporting you and putting you on the platform that you need to be on, pulling you into meetings that you need to be in. Those are all great. Um, as far as when you're interviewing though, I think it's a little bit harder. Um, definitely making sure that you're supported in the workplace and that you're confident enough to say, I deserve better if you're not being treated well. Those are super important for this. But when you're in an interview and you're meeting a company for the first time, I think the honest answer is it's really hard to know. Um, if you're in the interview at all, I would say that, you know, the person values your application. They weren't unaware that you were a woman generally. Um, so it's a good start. Um, and any job that doesn't interview you because you're a woman, you wouldn't want that job anyway. So good riddance. Um, <laughs> but when you're in that interview, I guess it's hard to say what a good question would be. Because um, I think in an interview, you would mostly be asking questions about how they're supporting their employees. It's hard to ask a question about, I don't think most people would say like, I hate women and I'm not going to hire them. Um, <laughs> but if you want to know more about the culture and how the employees in general are supported, because I do think there's a correlation between um, between doing outreach to the employees and making sure they're taken care of and being in a community that supports women. I think generally they go hand in hand that if you care about your employees more, you probably care about them regardless of their gender. Um, so asking about, you know, what resources do you have during crunch, which is a big one for video games? How do you support your employees through that? What learning opportunities are there? Do you support your employees going back to school? Do you have leadership programs? Do you have rotational programs like what Stephanie is going through? Um, what groups do you have at the company? This is a big one that we have now, um, networking groups. So we have groups for um, like Pacific Islander folk, uh, for women in games. Um, and all employees are encouraged to be a part of all, we have a lean in group for women at the office. Um, all employees are encouraged to be a part of all groups. It's not supposed to be, you can only be 
Pacific Islander and identity if you wanna be in this group. Um, it's really about, that's a space for learning about that identity and for people sharing experiences that are shared experiences with that group. Um, so asking a company if they have things like that will tell you a lot about how they feel about uh, diversity inclusion and whether or not they really prioritize it. Um, so yeah, I guess my only advice for beyond that would be if you're, if you have an idea of what you want your life at a company to look like, like you want to be able to have a group that is a leaning group to connect with other women, or you wanna have spaces to interact with other identities about what it's like to live in those shoes and build empathy with what it might be like to live the experience of a Pacific, Pacific Islander folk. Um, just ask if they already do it. Um, you can definitely pioneer it and start it at a company. I've definitely been a part of starting things at our company and helping to expand the circle of inclusion at our company. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that people didn't care at all or, or wanted that not to happen. It just means nobody started it yet. Um, but it, it really is a great indicator if you just ask about how they're supporting employees now to determine how they support women at the company. A great answer. Amber, Stephanie, do you wanna add anything on to that? Yes, I do, I do. Um, so those are all really, really, really good points. Um, and as far as, um, I mean, this probably goes unsaid, um, definitely research the company or the studio <laughs> when you're applying. Um, I know that some of them, their website's pretty barren or it only says, these are all the games we do. Um, but hopefully you can find a lot of good information on their website. Granted, you know, they are trying to sell themselves. So they might say, look at all this cool stuff that we do, but you know, underneath, um, it might not be all that it that they say that they are, if that makes sense. So one thing to consider is the the gaming community is very, very small if, if you um, in the grand scheme. Like everybody kind of knows everybody um, through like a second degree at least. And so a good way to do it, um, if you are connecting with people um, that work at these companies and you women, then you can ask them about like their experience or word will get around about uh, cultures of different studios. Like, oh, mm, if you if you value your free like work life balance, don't work at this place because they crunch six months out of the year. I don't know, I'm making up stuff, right? So word of mouth is definitely a good one. Um, researching the company. Zynga specifically is making a lot of cool strides for um, diversity and inclusion. Like when I go, I went to their website because I couldn't remember a lot of their stuff. But uh, when you go to life at Zynga, like one of the first things you see is diversity and inclusion. And you're just like, oh, okay, cool. And it goes over all the communities. Uh, they support like parents, um, amigos for the, for the Latin community, um, pet owners, women, like I think they uh, they have a pride one so the LGBTQ LGBTQ community um, I know that there's uh, one for like the black community as well all that kind of cool stuff um, but yeah uh, and I remember in my interview uh, they made a point like it wasn't people who were trying to like sell the company it was like hey in case no one's brought this up like. Zynga is super like woman friendly, like da 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 da. And uh, honestly, like working there, I've seen it firsthand. So it's, uh, I can't speak for all game companies, obviously, but some of them are making a lot of really good uh, strides towards that. Um, I don't know what the ratio is, but oh, ooh, sorry. Another thing is to, if, if it's available on the website, also look at the leadership. So like when I go to the leadership page on Zynga, um, one of, what is it? Uh, the chief legal officer is um, a female minority. And like, so that can kind of give you an idea of the kind of people that they would hire at their company. That's great. Uh, you guys both brought up Crunch. And so some questions popped up about, can you talk about Crunch and how often you experience it in UX? What is that like? Is the team very much involved in crunch? Yeah, define that for me, because I need, I need some uh, education here. Am I taking this one? Okay, so crunch in games. Um, so yes, I have experienced all different kinds of crunch. There is the crunch that is a result of poor management, and then there is the crunch that happens 
organically in any project-based industry when you're getting close to the deadline and like a, some variables came up that no one was anticipating. Um, the bad kind of crunch is when you have producers telling you that it's mandatory 10 hour days, you need to be here on the weekend. Um, like, no, you need to be like, you have to check in with me before you go and before you leave, um, passive aggressively guilting you into working the weekend um, when you are not paid overtime and then tracking your hours when you are salary and not paid overtime. Um, that is bad crunch, <laughs> stay away from that. Um, organic good crunch is when you're working late on a feature because you want to and because you want to invest your time in it and you want to make it better. Um, usually I will have a producer being like, Amber, no one's asking for this. And I'm like, but they need it. So um, that's, that's like a huge difference in the type of crunchy experience. And like, um, I've gone through like a couple of like solid crunches, I say, I would say it. Raven. Um, and like, the thing about it is like, if it's a good crunch, then like you and your teammates are joking around at like 11 o'clock at night while they're waiting for the build to pass and not fail. And um, I will usually go down the street and grab a bunch of candy and snacks and like throw them in people's offices, like <laughs> when it's like one in the morning or whatever. And like, that doesn't happen a ton, but like everybody makes it fun. And um, you know, you're on a good team when you're in that crunch period and like it's a good time to be at the office and like you're okay with it. Um, if you're on a team where you're the only one crunching and you're crunching solo, that's not fun and it's probably like a really bad sign. Um, that's not camaraderie, that's not teamwork. Um, that's, that's something I don't ever wanna do again. <laughs> Yeah, I can um, add a little bit to this as well. Um, I think I very much echo what Amber said. Um, crunching when you feel like being asked to crunch and feeling like you have to do it or you will lose your job or you will not be promoted or you will not be invited to that work event, anything, any kind of exclusion um, on any level, that's not okay. And you have every right to leave that situation and tell them to go F themselves. Um, the good kind of crunch is it's an art um, and it's a project industry. There is always gonna be a pencils down moment. Um, games like the ones that Amber works on, and I'm sure Stephanie as well, you are constantly updating them, um, but there's still, a pro there's still a pencils down moment on that update before you move on to the next one. Um, so there's always gonna be that like, oh, like I could, you know, go do this thing, or I could spend another hour working on this and get it into the game and the players will be able to see it. And even if I know I could put it into the next patch, it's like, oh, but they could see it in this one. I can make it that much better. Being excited about something that you're working on and putting in that extra time because you're choosing to do it and because it fills up your cup more than the other activity that you might not be doing because of it, that's good kind of crunch. And that's passionate people working on something and making it the best it can be and the best artwork it can be because they feel that they want to play it, that their friends want to play it, and that they want to show that off to the world. Um, that's very different from feeling like you have to do something or else. Um, and when you're looking at game studios and interviewing with game studios, my advice again is to just ask them how they support employees through that. And I only just want to illustrate some examples of support because I think some of these things are very different from web and mobile um, and you don't necessarily know what to ask for until you've been in games and seen what good support looks like. Um, and none of these things are requirements. They're just ideas and food for thought on what support can look like during crunch. Um, grocery delivery services, mowing your lawn, dog walking services, daycare services, uh, providing catered food um, for the people that are crunching. Things like that are going to be things that companies are able to support and good companies will support employees with. Um, things like mowing the lawn, house cleaning, things like mowing the lawn might not feel like when you're interviewing a big deal, but if you're working late into the night, then you can't mow your lawn at three in the morning and you don't wanna have to come late to work and not put that cool feature in because you gotta sit out until 8 a.m. to mow the lawn. So things like that can be really important. And even if you have a partner at home that can take care of it, they have their whole life and their whole job or the children, the dogs, you know, whatever the situation is, 
And it's nice to have a company support that so that your partner doesn't have to take on those extra tasks and so that your at-home life doesn't get harder because you're working on something that you're passionate about. Um, the other thing that Amber touched on is a big one in games. Uh, it is more common in games to be paid hourly at, when you're at the lower levels and not be salary until you're more senior or at a titled senior role. Um, this is a good thing just to think about when you're interviewing and when you're researching companies. The reason for that is that we do crunch. Um, hourly is provided with full benefits so that you are compensated for overtime. And you should ask about what that overtime compensation looks like. For some companies, that means that you're allowed to do it. For some companies, that means you're paid time and a half for any overtime. For some companies, that means you're paid time and a half for the first 20 hours and double time for the next 20 hours. So different companies have different policies. It's an important thing to ask about, especially if you're applying to the junior or mid-level roles. Um, hourly should not deter you. It's really intended to protect employees. Um, it costs the company more money to put you on hourly than to put you on salary. Um, so don't be afraid of that. And also make sure that you are, like Amber said, not working 40 hours of overtime a week on a salary at a junior level role. That is also toxic and taking advantage of an employee. Uh, and most games companies won't do that. I don't know any off the top of my head that do do that. But when you're interviewing, just keep that in mind and, and be sure to ask about that. It's a fair question and any uh, interviewer will be happy to tell you about their policies. That's great. St Stephanie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Have you had to experience crunch yet? Not really. Uh, unfortunately, I have not experienced crunch yet. And I don't know if it's just because of the nature of working on a live product where a lot of stuff might get punted to the next uh, release, if that makes sense. Because um, I know that, that happens a lot where uh, something will be on release and then we'll ask the PMs like, hey, like what, or the producers, like what, like, is it okay if this gets punted back? Or like, do we need this for this release? And things can get shuffled around. Um, but, or maybe they are uh, sheltering me as the intern, like, oh, like all this needs to take care of the crutch stuff. Like, <laughs> so um, nothing so far, but. Well, we are coming up on eight o'clock soon. So I wanted to ask one final question and a half. Okay, so the question is, what piece of advice would you give to designers that are UX designers in particular that are wanting to move into this particular uh, field? Um, and then can people get in touch with you for more? And how, how can they do that? So that's the half onto it. So who wants to start? I can start. Um, one, play a lot of games. That is a really good thing to do. Just so, because a lot of um, like having like a like a, I'll call it a mental toolkit, right? So like ideas come from you playing other games. Because if you're trying to solve a problem, you could be like, that's right, this one did this this way to do it. So playing a lot of games will really help. Um, Networking, talking to people who do the job that you want, that is a really good thing to do as well. And also practicing, like just doing projects on your own, delving into Unity and Unreal, and just practicing making games. Can, can they get in touch with you? Of course, of course, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, the best way to get in contact with me would be my LinkedIn. Um, I guess I can. Cindy, do you have that? You can provide it to everyone at the end or I can do it or I'll, I'll put my link in the chat. How about that? That'd be awesome. <laughs> you wanna go Amber or do you want me to go? Um, I can go. Um, so I think, you know, Stephanie touched on a lot of good things. Um, yeah, and I think like the biggest one is just like, don't, uh, like I am a perfectionist and I used to think that meant that people, those are people who do everything perfect, but it's not, it's people who are afraid to do anything because it's not perfect. Um, so like, do not hamstring yourself because you've never done this before. Um, I was supposed to be animating characters and now I'm doing this. Um, so like, just try it, put it out there, get feedback, um, you know, take critiques from it. And I think like, just don't be afraid to like, 
start solving these problems in, that you see in video games. And if you can just show me in a portfolio and talk through a piece you have in a portfolio and explain to me like why you changed something or solved something, like I am here for that conversation. Um, and like what I look for the most when we interview people are folks who are excited to learn more, who can admit that they don't know everything. Like I'm not gonna hire an expert because those don't exist. Um, and like, I wanna work with somebody who wants to learn with me, who wants to teach me things and who can like tell me stuff that I don't know. Um, so yeah, I think it's like, it, there's so much more about it being an attitude and a passion than it is about like a strong like background in it. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts on it. And then yes, you can contact me on LinkedIn, please. Um, I very much echo Stephanie and Amber's thoughts. I would say advice wise, very similar. Um, get experience however you can. Um, that can mean taking an internship and internships not always an option. So if you can't do something that's working for a games company in a formalized version, do that on your own. Take that opportunity where you can formulate it by yourself. Look at a game that you love and say, you know what, today instead of just playing it with my friends, I'm going to play it as a UX designer and I'm going to do a case study on why I would have made different decisions and what those decisions would have looked like and why I can understand, I think like Stephanie said earlier, why I can understand why the game design team might have not made that decision. Um, maybe they ran out of time, maybe they didn't have resources, maybe they didn't notice that that was a problem. Um, so yeah, I would just, if you can't do something that's a more formalized version of experience, then make that experience on your own and make it happen for yourself. Um, and yeah, when it comes to interviewing people, I think similar to Amber, I most wanna see people who are passionate about games and who are passionate about um, user experience, but mostly empathizing with people. And like Amber said, that's a lot of learning about people and, and listening to people and, and knowing when to talk and when not to talk. Um, so I really want to be with people that feel passionate. And I very much enjoy when people are passionate about things that are not just games. Um, it's really helpful to have passions outside of games that you can bring into the game. Like maybe I love Legos because I like putting things together. And how can we do something similar in Call of Duty? And that might be really abstract, but it can get us over the hill to another cool game mode or the next iteration that everybody loves. Um, so having passion for all kinds of artwork and all kinds of activities and entertainment is really great. Um, and you got to play the games. You don't have to play the game that the company makes, but you got to play some version of games and just understand what it is to be a player or to be competitive or to play, you know, with one hand if you really want to work on accessibility design, for example. Um, so yeah, just be passionate and really lean into the things that you love about games and have an opinion on those things and show that off. And don't be afraid to talk about that because we're all trying to do our best when we make games and design the best things. And an important part of that is just starting, like Amber said, just starting with an opinion and saying, man, like that sucked, like let's change it. Or like, oh, wow, that was really awesome. Let's keep going in that direction. Um, so showing that off in a portfolio will be really important. It doesn't have to be some grand opinion or anything, but just saying like, hey, this part of, Call of Duty was really frustrating or as a new player, I didn't understand it. And now I can see why that's powerful, but this would have helped me when I was a new player. Um, so yeah, just looking at those things and practicing them. Games and especially console games is a different experience from designing for web and mobile. So it's a nice tool to just start flexing those muscles before you're actually in the role and just start thinking about, you know, the screen is a totally different shape than it is for mobile. Um, you're looking at you're not looking at the corners of the screen, whereas on mobile, the menu is almost always in the top left or top right corner. It's just not something we do in video games. So what are those norms and that framework that we're working off of? And how can you learn more about that as quickly as possible? And you can definitely talk to me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. I will send my link in the chat right now. So feel free to add me there. I can answer any additional questions. Sydney, Amber, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us at UX and ATX. I really, I learned a lot tonight and um, I, you know what, I'm fascinated by what you do and I have considered like trying to get my own job in gaming at some point. I don't know. I think my employees would be upset with me, but yeah, <laughs> it would be really cool. <laughs> it would be super fun. <laughs>
<laughs> this was so awesome. I'm so happy I was able to come and speak about it because it's my favorite thing. And like, yeah, I'm with Sydney. Like, if you guys have any more questions, please reach out and ask. Um, happy to provide resources or pep talks, whatever you need. <laughs> Awesome. That's so great. Um, well, everybody, so I hope you all have a lovely night. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you all have questions. Um, and again, if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, just let me know that, like, that you saw me on UX and ATX so you can make it past my screening process. Um, I hope you all have a lovely night and um, we'll see you back on November 12th. Bye, guys. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. I can also fantastic. hang out for a couple minutes if there's any extra questions.